Quer fazer o um anúncio? Faço eu. Então é o seguinte, está uh, acontecendo, é, quem é que conhece a comunidade Ning? Ning. Ning é um site onde você pode construir a sua própria comunidade. Certo? Então, se você, é, se você curte, por exemplo, né, é, sites como Orkut, como Facebook, etc., o Ning, você pode construir a sua própria comunidade para... É, é, Quer dizer, você pode fazer o seu próprio Orkut, digamos assim. Então, o Ning é uma comunidade de comunidades. E o pessoal do Ning está fazendo um concurso. Eles estão dando de prêmio 9 mil dólares. Tá certo? 9 mil dólares para alguém, para quem fizer uma aplicação bacana usando o Ning. Tá? Então, é, esses 9 mil dólares são divididos em três linguagens de programação diferentes. É, eu me lembro que é Java... PHP e... Eu não me lembro qual é a terceira. São três linguagens diferentes, Java, PHP e uma outra. Tá certo? É, então, você pode fazer aplicação numa dessas três linguagens e o prêmio é de 3 mil dólares para cada, é, é, cada categoria. Tá certo? Então, quem estiver interessado em conhecer, você acessa o site teia.mg.gov.br teia.mg.gov.br então, vamos começar aqui agora a palestra do, do Simon Phipps sobre Open Source Scorecard. Mas eu pergunto para vocês aqui, quem precisa de tradução? Tradução. Não, só algumas poucas pessoas. Vamos fazer aquele esquema que eu estava fazendo aqui, então, sentar aqui. Ok. Simon. We'll see how we get on. All right. How long is the spine? That's much better. All right. Why you're why you were okay with it? Well I was going to use it. That was um electric sheet. Well, good evening. And um, I have the challenge here with uh, Bruno translating in a small circle of trying to c use words he cannot translate. So I'll do my very best. So my name is Simon Phipps. Um, I still work for some company related to Sun Microsystems. I have no idea who I work for at the moment or what my job is. But until yesterday, I was responsible for the uh, free and open source software strategy at Sun Microsystems. And in particular for clearing up the mess that was left after Denise left the company. Uh, so uh, we had all sorts of exciting mess left after that. Um, so OpenOffice was licensed under some strange licenses that I had to get rid of. Uh, I was not able to get rid of um, CDDL, unfortunately. Um, 
Denise is completely wrong in saying that the engineers wanted CDDL. Most of the engineers wanted GPL, but their management decided they should use CDDL. And as those management have all gone now, there is every chance that we might see GPL in the future of Open Solaris. But that's now all up to Oracle. Yep. Okay. But that was all yesterday. Um, one of the things that concerns me as we move forward with free software, and in particular with the idea of open source, is that um, the world is changing. We have the world of cloud computing coming on us. Uh, a, a very good name for the first time, by the way, because a cloud is made of vapor, and the idea of cloud computing seems to be so much vapor as well. So one of the first times the computing industry has picked the right name for an idea. Uh, another thing that is of deep concern is the idea of open core computing. The idea behind an open core business model is that a company makes the core code for their product open source, but what they actually sell is not open source. And that allows them to have all of the beautiful clothing of freedom while taking away all of their customers' liberty. I believe that is a big problem for us as a software freedom community. The problem that we continue to have is that companies say free software or open source, but they don't mean what we mean by that term. It would be like going out for a meal and deciding that we wanted to have a hot dog and being delivered something different to that on the table in front of us. Now, why does this happen? Why are we seeing open source, uh, the term open source used in a way that is not true? The reason is that corporations are reptiles. Corporations are not people with morals. They are machines that create profit. They always act predictably. They never act in a way that is intended to look after the moral context in which they are operating, unless that saves money. So a corporation can never be trusted to do the right thing unless they are forced to or the right thing is the most profitable thing. And that means that we have seen um, all sorts of interesting changes coming on around the world of open source. The truth about open source is that open source is a system of defining licenses whether you are part of the free software group world or part of the open source world, open source and free software has been largely defined by licenses for the last 10 years. And the truth is that when you make any set of rules, with the set of rules, you create the, um, the game that exploits those rules. Whenever you make a system, you also make the way to beat the system. And if you don't change the rules often enough, eventually the system gets completely defeated by those who look for the holes in the rules. You can see this happening all over the place with all sorts of technologies. Many of these technologies are based uh, in some part on free software. In particular, as Denise was saying in the previous session, all of Apple's products are based on free software. And yet, if you buy any Apple product, and I know this because I'm a customer of theirs, they have no concern for your freedom. They will take away your freedom 
as their first priority. They have no concern for whether you have liberty. Worse than that, you can tell when corporations are doing wrong because they use the same words that describe their evil to cover the wrong over. I'll give you some examples. When Microsoft wanted to defeat open document format, they called their competing uh, completely closed format uh, Open Office XML. They did that because by using those words that you would normally be used to criticize them, they are able to uh, conceal their lack of morals because most journalists and most fair-minded people will use the words Microsoft uses to describe itself. Another example is in looking at yesterday's announcements from Oracle, where they said that they were going to uh, protect open source projects, but they did not say which open source projects they were going to protect. Uh, by speaking uh, in positive terms, using all the words that would normally be used to criticize them, they cut off the criticism. So we see both of these things happening, and we see many, many people in the computer industry who like the toys so much that they decide not to wage a battle. And we are gradually losing our freedom because the slaves are so happy. The greatest enemy of liberty is happy slaves. How can we overcome this, this constant erosion of our liberty? Do we do it by focusing on the four freedoms, on software freedom? Well, yes and no. Uh, yes, what is important to us is software freedom, the freedom to use, to study, to modify, and to distribute software. But if we only define it in the terms that have been used up until now, we will discover that those four freedoms cannot be made to persist. So we need to go further than just licenses in understanding software freedom. We need to go beyond the GPL. We need to go beyond the open source initiatives, uh, open source definition. And we need to define software freedom in terms of a set of indicators, a set of flags that tell us whether freedom is present or not. So I'm going to propose to you a set of indicators, a set of flags that you can use to tell when freedom is present. Of course, the very first indicator of freedom is the presence of an OSI-approved license. If there is no OSI-approved license, then there is no software freedom. That's a very easy rule. Look for the OSI logo, and that will tell you whether there are grounds for software freedom. But it takes more than that now. A project, for example, like MySQL, has very little software freedom because the community is completely controlled by, well, it was by Sun and now by Oracle. There is no way that you can make substantial changes to MySQL and have them accepted back into the code base. It cannot happen. You can try, you can fill out the copyright assignment form, but the chances are that your contribution will not be accepted. And if you are making a large contribution, uh, like Google attempted to do, you will find that it is simply not welcome. So the first indicator of freedom beyond the license, I would suggest, is diverse ownership of the code. A project that has only one copyright holder is a project which is unlikely to promote software freedom. 
despite the fact that the company that I work for uses copyright assignment notices, I believe that they are, in general, an indicator of a, a, a loss of freedom. That does not mean you should not sign them if all of the other nine indicators that I'm going to tell you are present, it may be okay to work under a copyright assignment. And one of the points to make about these 10 rules that I'm, going to, that I'm giving you is that they are not absolute, or most of them are not absolute. You will find that every single free software project in the world failed one of these tests. So if you want to apply all 10 of these tests absolutely, you will never work with free software again. But they provide you with an indication of what is good and what is bad. So look, for example, <coughs> for a project that does not need copyright assignment. The Apache Software Foundation uses a license, the Apache Software License, that gives every participant right to the code as if it was their own. It gives rights equivalent to ownership. And so therefore, no participant has more rights than any other participant. That means every participant is free to do the same things. This is another way of putting the, the, the rule that I'm giving you. Another way of saying the same rule is if any participant has more rights than any other participant, then your freedom is being harmed. And in the Apache Software Foundation, everyone has the same rights. Similarly, in the Linux kernel, everyone has the same rights. Nobody has more rights than anyone else. And so your freedom is protected. But in uh, Sugar CRM, in Asterisk, in many, many projects, there is some party that has more rights than you. And in those projects, you should watch out for your freedom and check how many of these rules are being met. The second extra rule I would give you concerns how the community governs itself. Is there fair governance? How is the community run? A healthy community does not have a big spider in the center of the web. A healthy community will have a governance where um, every spider is equal, where it is possible for anybody to raise their voice and change things. But you don't want just anybody being able to raise their voice and change things, because let's face it, there are a lot of crazy people out there. So a healthy community will have rules that I call open meritocratic oligarchy. So what do I mean by that? I mean open. That is to say the community is open to anybody that has the skills to come into it. By meritocratic, what I mean is people get privilege by doing stuff. People who contribute get privilege. People who just talk don't get privilege. And finally, oligarchy. Oligarchy is a word from the Greek that means rule or govern, government by the best people. And an open source community will be led by the very best by recognition of all of the other people in the community. So if you look at any well-governed community, like Apache, like GNOME, you'll discover that it has an open meritocratic oligarchy as its system of governance. Not a pure democracy, but rather a world with limited entry, but entry gained by recognition of your skills and contribution. So look for that in the governance of a community. Look for transparency, with everything being open to be seen by everybody. No secrets, except in the most extreme cases. Look for a community with distributed authority, with many people making decisions, rather than just one person. 
My next indicator is to do with trademarks. Now, Denise talked about, used this phrase, intellectual property, which of course is a, a very bad English phrase that is always an indicator of somebody trying to take away your freedom. Whenever you see that phrase, intellectual property, there is somebody who wants you to think that copyright, patent, trademark, and trade secrets are all the same sort of thing. Now, they are not all the same sort of thing. They all have very different rules by which they operate. And that is a very important fact because open source licensing only licenses copyright. It does not do anything about trademarks and it does not do anything about patents. And consequently, a healthy open source project or community will take care of those things as well. In particular, it will make sure that trademarks are under the control of the community. So recently, you will have seen Matt Mullenweg from the WordPress uh, community. WordPress is actually a company that belongs to Matt. Matt has started the WordPress Foundation. And the WordPress Foundation exists to own the WordPress trademark so that the open source community around WordPress are in control of the trademark that describes their code. If that is not the case, then you, bad things can happen. You may be completely free to fork the code, but you may, in the process of forking the code, have to change all of the code to take out all the trademarks. And that is a, a significant barrier to exercising your software freedom. More than that, the trademarks also are used by larger communities to identify the code that they love. And so it is very hard in a community with a critical mass of users operating under a particular trademark to decide that they want to go somewhere else. It takes a really big problem to make them move. So if you want your freedom to be protected, make sure that the trademarks for the code that you love are under the control of the community. The next indicator for you is global diversity. By global diversity, what I mean is that anyone anywhere in the world could work on the project. A project which can only be used in one language or can only be used in one country may be free software, but it is not free. It is not looking after your liberty. So as an example, open source projects hosted by American corporations cannot be, cannot be used by the citizens of Syria because American export regulations prevent the citizens of Syria accessing any computer in the United States. So a project which is hosted only in the United States and does not have mirror servers in other countries like Brazil may have a free license but does not respect the freedoms of people all over the world. So if you're looking at a community, ask <clears throat> whether it promotes global freedom or whether it speaks English with an American accent. Because if it does that, it's likely that your freedom is not being protected. And it's possible that with a change of government, you could find yourselves cut off from the code you want to use. That is not just um, fear mongering, that has actually happened to the citizens of Iran who found that they were no longer able to use Windows on their computers because they could no longer access Windows update servers. And the government of Iran has had to migrate to free software to, so that they are able to get access to updates on their copies of Windows. So an indicator of your freedom is whether the project has got global diversity, has got lots of different colors in it, is available in all sorts of different countries all over the world. 
if you see all of those countries present, that is a good indicator that your software freedom is protected. The next indicator I'd give to you is business model diversity. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, some communities are closely associated with just one business model, just one way of earning a living from the code. A, a community that protects your freedom will be one where it is possible to make money on the code in whatever way works for you where you are. There will be no barriers. There will be no company that you have to ask for permission. There will be no dual licensing so that your competitor has more copyright rights than you do. A healthy community will have within it a number of different participants in the community earning money in different ways. Some of them maybe will be earning money from their state government to support the software for citizens. Some will be earning money from selling consulting service. Some will be earning money from packaging the software for easy installation, and so on. If you only see one kind of business in a community, that community has got a problem. Now, the problem may have a great explanation, but if you see only one business model, or worse, if a business model is uh, closely associated with the project, there's probably a bug. It's probably broken somehow. My next indicator for you is community-centric licensing. Now, Denise just told you how to pick an open source license. What Denise didn't tell you is that there is a big difference in what people think licenses are for. The lawyers at big companies believe that licenses are there to describe the context of a business relationship. They say that a license is between me and you. It is bilateral. It has two sides. And the license contains all of the rules for how you and I relate with each other. And creating the license is all about understanding how I will protect myself from you in this relationship. So when a corporate lawyer comes into open source, they look at licenses and assume the licenses are there to control their company's behavior. But in fact, the greatest authority on free software licensing, Eben Moglen, has said something different to that. He says that a license is the constitution for a community. A license is the constitution for a community. A, a free software license is not a bilateral license. It is a multilateral license. It does not describe how we protect ourselves from each other. Rather, it describes the boundary of our community. And people who choose open source licenses in order to be part of a global community are protecting your software freedom. People who choose open source licenses in order to protect themselves from you or to protect themselves from their competitors are not looking after your software freedom. In particular, projects that are licensed under licenses in that middle category Denise told you, licenses like the Mozilla public license, IBM's common public license, uh, Sun's Sun public license, CDDL, and other licenses like that, all of the projects that use those licenses are not protecting your freedoms. Instead, they are protecting the owner of the project from other people. They are bilateral. So a healthy community will be a community that has multilateral licensing. It's using a license like the Apache license, or the GPL, or BSD, rather than using a license that protects the copyright holder from other people. So look for community-centric licensing. 
my next indicator for you is whether there is software patent protection. Now, you may not think that matters in Brazil. Maybe it doesn't matter in Brazil, because at the moment, you have a sensible government that is resisting software patents. But software patents, I'm afraid, are very hard to kill. It is like that weed in your garden, which you kill, but comes up every year just the same. And software patents are with us for the long term. Software patents are very bad indeed for free software because they allow people outside the community to demand that people inside the community uh, are no longer able to create derivative works. Let me explain that. If I own a patent on a technique or an idea, I can tell you that you must pay me a, a royalty, a sum of money, every time you use my technique. Now that means that you have got to make sure that every user of your code is paying that royalty. But more importantly, it also means if you give your code to anybody else, you have to make sure they pay the royalty as well. And that means that you cannot exercise the fourth freedom, the freedom to distribute your work to anyone you wish because the royalty-bearing nature of the patents prevents you from doing so. Uh, now, that wouldn't be so bad if you knew it at the beginning of the project, but software patents are things that still apply even if they are not enforced. So I can wait until there is a big market for the technique that I have a patent on, and then I can suddenly pop up and demand from everybody that they pay me money. This is not a random fear. This happened to us. This ha Do you remember the, the GIF format, the GIF file format, where it turned out that Unisys had a patent on the compression algorithm in the code? And suddenly, they started saying to webmasters everywhere, you must pay us thousands of dollars if you have GIF images on your website. They had not disclosed the patent while the web was starting. They had not enforced the patent at any point prior to the web succeeding. But as soon as the web was big enough, they were able to pop up and say, give me your money or I kill you. Now that is what we have to prevent happening in free software communities. How can we do that? Well, you have to understand where patents come from on software. Most patents on a software project happen while the software project is in progress. So as the project goes along, anyone who is working on the project and is employed by a big corporation like IBM or Sun or Microsoft will be given incentives to file a patent every day. So just as maybe you brush your teeth every morning or you comb your hair, if you work for a big corporation, you file a patent every morning because they give you $100 for every patent you file. And they give you $1,000 for every patent that gets issued. So they incent their employees to file patents. And I guarantee you that the corporate participants in open source projects are filing patents the whole time in parallel with the development of the code. I guarantee you that parallel filing is happening. This means that most of the software patents that we as the free software community need to worry about are coming from within our own community. It is our own colleagues and friends who are filing these patents. It's probably not a problem <clears throat> all the time they work for their current employer and their current employer remains on track supporting free software. But what happens when the company changes hands? What happens to all those patents when the company goes out of business? Well, those patents are put up for auction. They are sold to whoever will pay the most money for them 
by the liquidator, by the man who is selling the company. And that was the reason, by the way, why I disagreed with Monty Widenius trying to block the sale of Sun. Because if Oracle had not bought Sun, I believe what would have happened is Sun would have gone out of business and all of its assets would have just been sold to the highest bidder, including Sun's patent portfolio that includes the patent on the shopping cart, the patent on the search engine, the patent on the mouse pointer, and many other patents that would do great harm in the hands of the wrong person. Fortunately, Sun has been bought by Oracle. Now, I say fortunately because that is not necessarily a good thing, but it is not the worst thing that could have happened. And that is why I am not so sad about it. Just that sad instead of that sad. So how do you protect yourself against patents? Well, let's assume this is your project. The patents, some of the patents can be covered by what are called patent grants, by companies that own the patents donating them to an organization like the Open Innovation Network, who then hold the patents and exercise them on behalf of free software. But that is not very good. The reason it is not very good is, well, there are two reasons. The first reason is Open Innovation Network only protects its members, not you. Secondly, because um, the, the the use of patents by something like Open Innovation Network involves um, threatening the, the uh, patent holder that is threatening the community with these patents. They say, if you use your patents against me, I will use all of my patents against you. It's what used to be called mutually assured destruction or nuclear war. And the idea was that no one would do it because it was so bad. So that is what patent grants and patent pools are about. They are about threatening nuclear war. And there are, you know about cockroaches. Cockroaches are immune to nuclear war. And there are some, think, some entities out in the public sphere called patent trolls. They are the cockroaches of the software world with all of the same charm and beauty as well. And they will not be killed by this option because there is nothing to attack. So the second option is covenants. A covenant is where a company says, I promise you that I will not use my patents against anything that falls inside this circle. So for example, I made a covenant with the free software community that Sun Microsystems and its successors like Oracle would not make any patent claims against open document format, ODF. So if you develop ODF, you can guarantee that Sun will not make a patent claim against you. Now that is very good, but it is only so good. It is only good to the point where the commitment ends. <clears throat> if you move in a piece of code outside the sphere of the covenant, Let's say you implement um, some other feature that is not to do with ODF in your word processor, you lose the protection. So the third way to protect people against uh, software patents is to put the patent handling in the license. And so this has been a very long point. If you want software freedom, look for communities that have licenses that deal with patents. So a community like uh, using the Apache software license, the Apache license deals with, patent, uh, with software patents. Um, the GPL version 3, GPL v3, deals with software patents. CDDL deals with software patents. So projects that use those licenses are safe against patents that are created by their own community members. And as that is almost all software patents, that means they are very safe indeed for the long term. So my advice to you is to look for projects 
with licenses that deal with software patterns. My final indicator for you is to look for open standards. Uh, projects that do not implement open standards, well, you can't use something else instead of them. So a database project, for example, that does not implement SQL is very interesting, but it is also a dead end. You can never drop that project and move to another. Your freedom to leave is not present. So look for projects that implement truly open standards. Projects that don't implement open standards are not guaranteeing your freedom. Now, there may be good reasons to go to a project that is not implementing open standards. And if it gets a good score on the rest of the list, then it is probably safe. But if it does not implement open standards and it has a poor score on the rest of the list, your software freedom is in danger. There's one more thing to say, is you should look for companies to deal with who cultivate your software freedoms. Businesses that are concerned that you keep your software freedom. So businesses that say, here is our wonderful software, and the free version is over there if you go look for it, are not respecting and cultivating your software freedom. Whereas companies that say, the software that we are working on is open source, is free software, are protecting your software freedom. Companies that rely on plugins and add-ons that are not free software on top of free software are not cultivating software freedom. They are trying to make you become dependent on things that are not free. So look for companies that cultivate your software freedoms. So now let's put all of that together into a single list. Um, the first thing to realize about a list of scores for software freedom is that it is a continuum. It is a continuous line. And there is no point on that line that you can say good is that way and bad is that way. The line is a continuous line. And you have to find your own place on it. There are no existing projects that fulfill all 10 of the points that I've just given you. All projects endanger your software freedoms somehow. In fact, I would go further and say that it is the loss of the software freedoms that probably will give you your innovative edge against your competitors. So look at what you're doing and see whether there is a high score and decide for yourself what score is good. For most people, a score of six yes or seven yes is probably the dividing line. Less than six, yeah, you're in trouble. More than six, you're pretty safe. Uh, this is intended as a guide. It is not intended as the rule. So let's look at the list. I've broken it down into two sets for you. First of all, these are the moral sets. Look at a project and see whether it is diverse, whether it has many different kinds of participants, both from different cultures in different parts of the world and whether it has different business models. Diversity is a mark of a healthy community. Second, look for fair governance. A good community will have open, meritocratic, oligarchic governance. Open to anyone that contributes and is good enough. And an, a, a good community will be transparent, will not keep secrets from people. And a good community will have many leaders rather than just one leader. Not too many. A community with a thousand leaders has no leader. But a community with one leader 
is called a dictatorship. A good community will have several. So, for example, the Linux kernel actually has a kernel group with several members. Even though Linus has a big vote, his is not the only vote. And if he was ever wrong, the rest of the group would probably override him. And then look for people who cultivate your software freedom. People who want you to be free. Wanting you to be free does not mean not wanting to make money. But I believe, and I've tried to uh, live out at Sun, the idea that you can both promote software freedom and make money. And I believe that you should look for the companies that want to do those two things. And then the second set are to do with copyrights, patents, and trademarks. Look for communities that have got a community-controlled copyright, an OSI-approved license, a license chosen because of the community rather than because of the sponsor, a license where the copyright is in diverse ownership so everyone has equal rights. Look for a project which has community-controlled trademarks, trademarks that can be used by anyone in the community that is willing to follow the rules and that has rules set by the community. Look for software patent protection, preferably in the license, and look for open standards. That's 10 different points I've given you. You might have different points to use here in Brazil, but I encourage you to choose free software on the basis of more than just the license. The GPL is not enough to guarantee your freedom. You need more than just the license to make sure that you are free. To be free, it's not just about the license, it is also about being a happy family working together. So with that, I'd like to say thank you, and we can take questions for five minutes. So does anyone have any questions? I have Bruno. What do you think about, you, you talked about business models, what do you think about uh, donationware and why, why it took a big uh, chunk of the open source community outside Brazil? Brazil it's not a place where you see a lot of donationware. Uh, why you, what do you think about that? So the question is about donationware, where you make the software available and you ask people to make voluntary donations. Or I actually used to run a business uh, in 1989 that sold shareware, where um, the only thing that happened when you paid was I gave you a little smiley face that went on the front of the software. Uh, so donationware. The problem with donationware is that not very many people make a donation. Um, so when I was running my business, I had maybe a hundred thousand users of my software, and I had maybe a thousand donations. Um, now I'm actually very pleased about that, because that made me enough money to pay for my house. But there are a lot of companies out there that think that is terrible. Microsoft makes something like 200% a year profit on its investment in its software. And it would see donationware as horribly inferior. So um, donationware is typically good for people who have another job. And I would expect donationware to be very popular in Brazil because there are a lot of people who are very clever with software but also have a day job. I'm surprised you don't have more donationware, actually. Donationware... Ah, oh, yeah. And Bruno, of course, says the problem in Brazil is that no one at all makes any donations. So that could be the problem. 
Any, any other questions? About uh, software pa patent, um, uh, is is the patent office allowed to read the code? And if they can read the code, they read the code. So, so the the patent. One of the things about software patents, one of the reasons I hate software patents so much, is that they are no use. Um, patents are actually quite a good idea. If it's really hard work to make an, in, an invention, it can be quite a good idea to give the inventor a temporary monopoly, a temporary time where they can make money from their idea without it being stolen. But for software, there, it's really easy to come up with ideas in software. We, you know, we all come up with a new idea every day, every hour. Every time you write a line of code, you invent something. And um, software patents, the other thing about real patents on machines is the patent tells you how to make the machine. But software patents don't tell you how to make the software. To do, to do that, they would have to have sample code in them. And sample code would have to be covered by copyright. And copyright material cannot be patented. So therefore, Patent people filing patents don't ever put sample code in their patents. So a software patent only contains a description of the software by somebody who does not write code, by a patent lawyer. And the description he writes is typically designed so that a, a lawyer can prosecute an infringer. So a software patent is simply a list of things, of, of uh, traps you could fall into that then can be used by a patent lawyer. And that completely breaks the social contract of a patent. Because the idea of a patent is that in return for temporary protection, I give my idea to the public domain. But a software patent does not contain the idea. It just tells you how to find if someone else has used your idea. And consequently, software patents completely fail the social contract. And you as citizens should protest loudly if ever software patents are proposed in Brazil, because they are a complete violation of your freedoms as a, as a citizen. So, no, long answer to your short question. No, the software, the patent office does not ever read the source code, because if the source code was presented to them, they would deny the patent. We have one minute. Tell you what. So uh, Sun Microsystems has gone now. And um, I brought with me from my office um, the last box of Sun open source pens. Uh, if you would like one, then do come up and, and get one from me. I think I've got enough for everyone here. Thank you very much.